Thank you, Nathan. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be sharing with you. And uh, it's uh, just a joy to know another church is looking at this series, Jesus the Game Changer. For those who don't know, I, I worked in a church uh, in Sydney for a long time and did a media at the same time. I'm not, I think I'd probably might have finished up at Guy Mere Baptist by the time when I was with you the last time. Uh, but essentially, five years ago, uh, we stepped into uh, doing media full-time, Christian media, and seeking to produce great material that churches can use. Our, our shows are, are now shown globally on a whole bunch of different Christian uh, cable networks. We now have a relationship with a group called TBN in the US who have exclusive rights to Jesus the Game Change because they loved it so much and they want us to produce more shows, which is great. But our pa passion and heart, as Jane is the creative director of Olive Tree Media, and, and my role is actually that local churches would do exactly what you're doing. This is our heart. We want to see people use it in their local churches. We want to see Christians encouraged. We want to see you share this material with your friends. But this morning, I actually want to introduce it. I'll touch on a, a, a couple of pieces of information that Cass might share next week as she preaches and, and teaches on equality. And I want to introduce the series, Jesus the Game Changer to you. Just if you haven't seen, I know that Nathan said they uh, shared the clip last week and you might have seen the trailer. If you haven't seen the trailer, so let me let you know that this is a documentary. It's a bit like a, very much the same as, as Towards Belief. This is not me speaking for lots of time. You'll see me as the interviewer, host, and I take you around to meet some great minds in some fabulous locations around the world with high production values to introduce this concept that Jesus is a game changer. There's 10 episodes. You're going to look at five weeks. So there's another five episodes. And, uh, and, uh, and there is a DVD, as we saw. Um, if you're not sure where your DVD player is, uh, my son is in IT and when we were producing this, he said, where are you up to, Dad? I said, we're pressing the DVD. He said, seriously, Dad, does anybody buy a DVD anymore? <laughs> well, apparently they do, but uh, it, it's streamed. The app is absolutely free. Uh, uh, on Android or on iTunes. If you love paper and you want to write notes, get the book. But if you just want to use the app for free, just go down and, and download the app. You can't watch the series on the app, but all of the, all of the uh, study group questions are on the app. And it's a resource to encourage you, to stretch you and to challenge people in their worldview. Because right now, uh, the worldview of Australians and, most, and many people in Western democratic nations need to have their worldview challenged about the person of Jesus and the influence of Christian faith in our world. One of, the, one of the motivations for pulling this series together was really this question, the question of, is religion a force for good? Uh, and that question is a live question across the globe. Is religion actually a force for good? Now, some of you will say, well, no, religion isn't a force for good. And we, we know that things like the, the attack on the World Trade Center was, was motivated by another religious group. And they're, they're certainly not good. But we're Christians. We're followers of Jesus. We're a force for good. But some of the others aren't. Here's the deal. Nobody makes that distinction. Religion is pulled together. In essence, what we hold to and believe as having a framework of life generated, generated out of God's Word for us is seen by many people as religion and it's not a force for good. In fact, one of the ways to, to discuss whether religion is a force for good and how the general community kind of responds to Christian faith is demonstrated by two stories that happened pretty much 50 to 60 years apart. I want to take you back to 1956. In January 1956, so many of you will know this story, and it's the story of Jim Elliott. Now, Jim Elliott, with five of his friends, the, 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 uh, the uh, pilot of the plane was a guy called Nate Saint. They went to Ecuador in South America. They were going to the Alca Indians and they were bringing the gospel to the Alca Indians. At that period of time, there were many Whitcliffe Bible translators who were going into South America and, and contacting uh, small tribes, groups of people, individual people groups. They were learning their language. They were translating the Bible into their language. They were printing the Bible into their language. And uh, Don't underestimate the enormous influence that had. And that's what Jim Elliott was seeking to do. They trained, they prayed up, they were young men all in their mid, early to mid-20s and they arrive on the beach just near this tribe, the Alca Indians in Ecuador. Here they are, ready, supported, about to take the message of Jesus to this group of people. Within two days, they were all dead. They'd been speared to death by these tribal people. And around the world, the response was remarkable. 
In fact, they were written about around the world. Uh, in the, the next few months, they were on the, life, the front page of Life magazine. At that point, that was a big deal. Uh, and, and the response was remarkable. Here are these people that had given their lives so that other people who had never heard of Jesus get the opportunity to respond to the world-changing message of the Christian church. It was pretty much universally endorsed as a great thing. There was an increase in the number of missionaries. There was an increase in missionary activity. Uh, Elizabeth Elliot became quite famous in writing the story of her husband's life. I think it was the book was called Through Gates of Splendour. Nate Saint's sister wrote books about, th about these five young men. Uh, eventually, they are, they are actually on, on This Is Your Life as a, as a major international television show in the United States. Essentially, this was a great story seen as a terrible tragedy of people doing good things in the world and good things for our community. Let me leap forward to last year, September last year. And in September 2018, uh, a young man had decided his name was John Chow and he wanted to go to another group of people who had never been reached with the gospel. Probably the most isolated uh, tribal group anywhere in the world. They're called the North Sentinelese. They're on a, uh, a small island off the coast of India. He'd, uh, he'd been trained. He'd been prepared. He'd for many years had this vision to take the gospel to those who had never heard of Jesus. He knew about this group and he decided to go and reach this group for Jesus. John Cho arrived on the beach. There's all sorts of weird stories about may, what may or may not happen, but this is what we know. His body's never been recovered, but he died on that beach that day. Now, the response to John Chow and what he did was diametrically opposite to the response to Jim Elliott and his four friends who died on that beach. In fact, this morning, I kid you not, as I arrived in the car park and I was looking at uh, the news feed on my phone, there's actually a story released today on my news feed about John Chow. Can you believe that? And this is what they say about John Chow. Here's the news story. I didn't read the whole thing. I had, uh, I had a church service to get to. I couldn't read the whole thing. But this, this is part of the quote. This is a part of the response of our world to what John Chow was doing. In a stream of tweets, takes and TV segments over months that followed, Chow was characterised as, as best a dumbass backpacker, at worst a Christian supremacist indifferent to genocide. Getting the drift? Uh, his, his ignoring the tribe's wish to be left alone and the risks he posed to them were attributed to imperialist arrogance. His attempt to save the Sentinelese was ascribed to delusional brainwashing. How's that? A different response to the missionary activity of the church that we're a part of and the faith that we believe in. This world has shifted so that they now see that what John Chow was doing was a dangerous thing and that religion is a negative force and the North Sentinelese would be better left alone than annoyed by Christians. That's the shift in our community. And what we want to do is to speak into that shift and into that worldview that says that Christian faith is a dangerous idea, that Christianity is a dangerous idea. Then you think about this. What do you want to do with dangerous ideas? If there's a dangerous idea within the community, what do you do with it? Well, you take it out of the public square, don't you? You take it out of the public square of media. You take it out of education. You certainly take it out of schools where it might influence children. You take it out of politics. You take it out of area. And it, it's something that you want to do this on your own, here at church or at home, knock yourself out. But don't annoy the rest of us with us because we want our public square to be free of the influence, the dangerous influence of an idea like Christian faith or religion. And here's the, 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 the foundational value of this series. Christian faith help build your public square. That's the piece you need to grasp. That the 
person sitting this morning reading his paper, if anybody reads the paper anymore, uh, watching telly, having breakfast, having a coffee in his home, any couple of kilometres from here who never gives a thought to the church, never turns up to a, a worship service, isn't a part of Christian faith at all, their life is influenced by the teaching and life of Jesus of Nazareth. What happens though is that we've disconnected the foundational values of our community from the person of Jesus. Jesus is deeply influential still today across the globe. I mean, you think about this. Christian faith now has 2.1 billion people across the globe, depending on how you do your theology and your numbers. It's the largest religion of any faith in the globe right now. It continues to grow. I mean, we get this concept in places like Australia that Christianity is, you know, no, no, the nons are rising. Europe is moving away from faith. America is in, in some sort of issue. It's, you know, Christian faith is shrinking. That's because we're in the West. In Africa, it's exploding. In somewhere around uh, in 1900, the number of Christians in Africa was about 9 million. At the beginning of this last century, it was 250 million. And they believe that in, in the, the next 20 years, it will grow exponentially again. It's growing enormously in China, enormously in South America. Everywhere but the West, it continues to grow. Christianity still is deeply influential in our world, just in its growth and its numbers, but it's deeply influential in our values. Much of what's been created in Western liberal democratic nations actually have their roots back in the person of Jesus in the early church. Now, some of you will be going, well, I'm glad I'm in church and, and it's good to be here and I'm loving Jesus, but boy, this sounds like a stretch. That's because we need to read a bit more and it's because we don't want to swallow the narrative that's been pushed at you by a secular media on an ongoing basis. There's a guy called Yuroslav Palakin, which is a great name, isn't it? He wrote a book called uh, uh, Jesus Through the Centuries. And he, got, he gives this picture which kind of gets at what I'm trying to say. It's a bit odd, but see if you can stay with me. He said, I want you to, he said, imagine that you could create a magnet, this massive magnet. And this massive magnet you could hold over human history. I know this is weird, but stay with me. This massive magnet you could hold over human history. And that magnet would drag out of human history every shard of metal in human history in the last 2,000 years that had any connection to the person of Jesus or the church. Anything in architecture in music, in literature, in thinking, in health, in education, all of those areas. If you hold that magnet and you drag everything out of Western history that had anything to do with Jesus, what would be left? The question is, the point is not a lot because much of what's happened in the roots of nations like ours in the Western democratic way of thinking actually has much of its roots in the, in the person of Jesus, which is an enormous surprise because you think about what Jesus left. When Jesus left, how much did he leave? And if you're not sure, the answer is not very much. I mean, we kind of think, well, there's the church you've just talked about. You know, two billion people around the world. He, he, he's got the Bible. It's, you know, Jesus left a lot. But at the point of either his death or his resurrection or his ascension, you can choose which one you like. What did he actually leave? The point is not much. He didn't write a book. The book, the Bible was written about him. He didn't write it. He didn't actually kind of organisationally start an organisation, didn't register Christian church with the, the, uh, the authorities in, in Jerusalem or the Roman Empire. He, he didn't actually own any property. He owned no assets of any value at all. He didn't travel very far, perhaps to here, the distance from here to Victor Harbour and back, that would have been it. He didn't really talk to that many people. I mean, yes, there's large crowds that listen to Jesus, but given the human history and the billions of people that have lived, it's not a drop in the bucket, it's a drop in the ocean. I mean, really, the, the, the idea that the name of Jesus would have lasted five minutes was a bizarre notion. I want you to imagine a conversation. Caesar Augustus was the head of the Roman Empire at that period of time. It ruled all of Rome from, from what we now know as Iraq all the way through to England, you know, all the way through Palestine, what is now Turkey, Greece, Italy, Spain, Southern Europe, all the way to England. One guy ran all of that. And I want you to imagine a conversation between two people who are bored and I was trying to think of something to talk about. Then they said, 
Who do you think we'll be talking about in 20 years' time? Jesus of Nazareth or Caesar Augustus? Who would have said Jesus? Nobody would have said Jesus, just in case you're wondering. Now, here is the guy that runs that, all of that, billions of dollars, thousands of, 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 uh, of members of the armed forces, the Roman Empire, uh, the army. They created roads all over the place so they could get their armies anywhere very quickly. Enormously powerful. Uh, Caesar Augustus apparently designed his own mauss mausoleum with uh, two big brass plaques on each side of the door listing the 35 of his greatest achievements. No problems with self-esteem with our Caesar Augustus, you know. Like, he, he's the guy that runs the world. Nobody would have said they're going to be talking about Jesus. And here we are 2,000 years later. And why do we know the name Caesar Augustus? Because in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says, at the time of Caesar Augustus, he decided to have a census. And it's the story of the birth of Jesus. You know, there's a bit of a corny phrase that is said these days. I wish it's not mine. I didn't make this up. Somebody else did. But said, you know, these days... A sign of how things have changed since that period or that dis potential discussion is that, well, a generation ago, we used to name our children Paul and Mary and John and Peter, and we name our dogs Caesar and Nero. <laughs> uh, Jesus is still enormously influential, even though at the time he didn't leave very much. And what he left, though, was a bunch of followers who influenced their world, influenced the known world, and continue to influence the known world so that many of our foundational values actually comes from the person of Jesus. Now, I'm going to mention two. Cass is going to do a great job on, on one of them next week. And I just want to mention two this morning. And one is the idea of equality. One of our foundational values in a place like Australia and most Western nations is that people are of equal dignity and worth, the dignity and worth of every individual. If you were bumped into people in the street, walk through a, a, a shopping centre today and just stopped random strangers, don't do it, it's socially unacceptable. But if you did and you said to them, do you believe that all people are equal? I doubt that you'd find anyone who would say, no, I don't think people are equal at all. It's just a, a value that we all hold to. Now, two things to say about that. First, just because we hold to it doesn't mean we live it out, either as individuals or as a nation. Are we completely equal as a nation? No, we're not. But that doesn't mean we don't hold to it as a value. We, we still hang on to it. We just don't get the ability to live it out. The second thing to say, and this is just as an aside, think about this at some other point. Just because all people are equal doesn't make all ideas equal. You can, you can believe in the equality of all people and the dignity and worth of all people and still disagree with them. That's okay to do. We get this idea that if we treat everybody equally, we have to treat all their ideas equally. And that's not the case. But just as those two asides, we do believe in the dignity, worth and equality of all people. Where did that idea come from? Why do we think that people ought to be treated with dignity and worth? Why do we believe that a broken, disabled child really has the same dignity and worth as a billionaire. Now again, because of our brokenness, we might treat them differently, but we still say there is worth in that child and we will not dispose of that child because there is worth in that child. Where did that come from? Because in the Greco-Roman world that Jesus lived in and existed in, that was not believed. They didn't hold to that at all. In fact, they believed in natural inequality. They believed that the world was, was created in a way that there were those who served others and that was their job in the world. In fact, hundreds of thousands of slaves around the Greco-Roman world allowed for the kind of uh, elite, the rhetoricians, the, the kind of thinkers of the world to do what they wanted because they were basically a whole society was built on a, a functioning slave class. Uh, Aristotle, that great philosopher, used to believe in the natural inequality with people and the slaves were created as slaves and that was their job. In fact, if you owned a slave, it was a bit like owning a tool, a living tool. You owned an axe, you owned a shovel and you owned a slave. It was pretty much the same and that's what their job was. Uh, Plato believed that women were unequal, we're going, to mention, we're going to talk about women tonight, but just as an aside, that, that women were unequal to men in every way, emotionally, in, intellectually, physically and ought to be treated that way. Even Jewish men used to pray every day, Lord God, I thank you that I was not born a Gentile, a slave or a woman. 
So here's this concept of an elitist society that believed in a slave class or an underclass, and that was normal. How do we get to where we are today? Well, Larry Seedentop is a guy who we didn't actually talk to uh, because he was sick when we were in, in London. Uh, but he's written a book. If this is your area, look up Larry Seedentop, and he's, his book is called Inventing the Individual. He writes the book as an historian and a thinker, not as a Christian. I don't even know if the guy's a Christian. But Inventing the Individual starts with pre-Roman times, looks at the Greco-Roman world, and traces the concept that the individual matters, that the individual's important, that people have dignity and worth as individuals beyond what they actually do. And what he, you know what he says? That is the gift of the Christian church to the world in which we now live. That's his summation at the end of the chapter. If you don't want to read four, 380 pages, just go to the summary at the end. Cracking summary. Here's the deal. Why do we get there? Because the followers of Jesus picked up what the Old Testament said. What does the Old Testament say? It says we are created. God, in Genesis chapter 1, created man in his image. Male and female, he created them. We bear the stamp of God. We bear the imprint of God. We have the fingerprints of God all over us. The psalmist in one, Psalm 139, what does the psalmist say? You knit me together in my mother's wound. In that dark place, I was knit, knit together by the hand and will of God. We believe that all people are there. All of us have the imprint of God. All of us have the spark of God. And that's what gives us all dignity and worth because you know what there are there are places around the world that even today that don't hold to that I mean you go to India now I'm not I'm not wanting to be disparaging of people from Indian descent and I'm not saying that every person who believes in Hindu philosophy doesn't treat people equally but here's the deal if you're a Hindu as long as a whole bunch of other things you believe in two things reincarnation and karma now, reincarnation and karma work like this. You don't actually die and just, you know, rot in the ground. You come back again. And life is this kind of revolving, reincarnated each time. But how you come back depends on how you lived. If you lived a really good life, you kind of come back further up the pole of life, of society, of, 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 uh, of our situation. If, if you lived a bad life, then you, live, you come back further down. Eventually, you'll come back as a gnat if you're bad enough. You know, this is whole idea that where, how you've lived is how you'll be reincarnated. Now, think about this. If that's your philosophical worldview and you're in the Brahmin caste, the, the elite class, the wealthy, educated, uh, powerful class in India, what do you feel about your circumstance? Well, you feel a complete sense of entitlement. I don't know what I did in that last life, but pff, must have been pretty good because look at my life. And I don't know what you did in, as a slave living on the street in your past life, but it, it mustn't have been too good because look where you live. And the worst outcome of that is this, that you, you don't want to, I'm not saying that Indian people don't help other people, don't hear me say that, but here's the philosophical uh, uh, framework that I don't want to even help you where you are because I'm messing with your karma. Now, in the series, we actually have a couple of Vishal Mengalwadi and Josi Chako, both of Indian descent, who talk about that within Indian society. So your framework of the philosophical religious framework actually leads some people to believe not in equality, but the opposite of equality. And here we have Jesus picking up this concept that we are the children of God, the fingerprint of God, the spark of the divine. So every person has dignity and worth and the equality of every individual. And that's why we live this out. I mean, think about this in a couple of weeks ago. It's a remarkable thing, really. A few weeks ago, we voted. And when we voted, your vote was worth exactly the same amount in the poll as Scott Morrison's vote. Now, just let that sink in. That's a remarkable thing. Now, you think, well, he runs the party, he's got all this other influence. That may be true. But philosophically, everybody's vote's worth the same. Everybody's worth the same. Everybody has dignity and worth, and we will do what we can because that is a gift to Western democratic nations from the person of Jesus, the early church, and the teaching of the church. And the other thing about, uh, about the West that we hold to is the fact that we care. We have discussions about care in our society, 
about caring for the needy, caring for the sick, caring for the poor. And the debates that we have in our society is, so who should pay? How much should we pay? Who should deliver it? How should it be delivered? What level of care do we give to what level of people in concern? I don't think there's too many people in our nations that go, we don't care. Let them rot. Doesn't matter. There's not a lot of that. Pretty much it's a sense of we should care. Now, like equality, where did that idea come from? Because the Greco-Roman world seriously did not care. The individual didn't matter. And if you were in a bad space, riding on the side of the ground, too bad. We don't care. Rodney Stark is um, he, he's a professor in sociology who's written like 40 books. He's quite elderly now and apparently not very well. He's at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, has written numbers of books in this area. And one of, the, one of the points he makes about the influence of Christianity, how did this tiny group of people from Palestine end up growing a faith that Constantine, 300 years later, would make it the faith of the Roman Empire. Stark reckons it was probably 10% of the Roman Empire at that point were Christian, which is a quite a remarkable growth. But he, his point is that one of the reasons that they drew so many people to the church, to faith, to, to gatherings of Christians is because they cared because they actually cared what happened to people. And one of the, one of the places that, that's demonstrated is, is in Matthew chapter 25. It's a passage that many of you have heard of, even though you probably can't draw it to mind right now. Matthew chapter 25, starting about verse 31, is where Jesus tells this parable. It's kind of like a, it's a picture parable, a, a picture of what's happening at the end of time. And what's happening in, in this parable is that God has is as the king, God, has all the nations in front of him and he's judging the nations. Now, I, I said this in the first service, I say this every time I mention this, that the key to remember this is you've got to read these verses in the context of all of the Bible. Because if you don't, it sounds like you earn your way into the kingdom of God by what you do. That's what these verses sound like. And we know, if you want to be right with God for eternity, it's because of the death and resurrection of Jesus and our response to that. But how we live that response out is really important, which is the point of these verses. So here is God. He's got the people in front of him. He's separating the sheep on his right from the goats on his left. And then when he separates the sheep who are going to go into his eternal glory from the goats, this is what he says. Uh, he said, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared to you, for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison, and you looked after me, uh, and you came to visit me. And now this is a loose translation of what then happens. So all the people on the right that are going into the kingdom of God for eternity with their heavenly father are about to wander off and then they turn back to the king and they say, we are really pleased to be going into eternity with you. We are wrapped to be sheep on the right, not goats on the left. We are pleased that this is happening. But just before we go, one simple question. When exactly did we see you homeless or clothes, no, no, naked and needing clothing or thirsty and needing something to drink or, or in prison and we visited you? Because we reckon we might have remembered and we don't actually remember ever doing that. Now keep in mind, in a society that did not care, this was a pretty interesting statement. And then what does the king say? You know the words, don't you? Whatever you did, to the least of these, my brothers, you did for me. Be under no illusion that that didn't change the world. Literally changed the world. Because now you had a group of people following Jesus, following the Messiah, following their king. Whatever happened to them, they would know that whenever there was somebody that was in need, they were serving Jesus. Whenever there was somebody that was broken, they were serving Jesus. Whenever there was somebody who was in desperate, desperate need, they weren't just an individual who was annoying. He was the face of God. And these communities across the, the, the Greco-Roman world started to serve their communities. And they would, they, they would be a whole network of care that did not exist. 
There's a guy called Julian the Apostate. How'd you like to be known as Julian the Apostate for the rest of the time? Julian the Apostate was... Constantine became the emperor around th- just after 300 AD. And this was his kind of great nephew. He, he became the emperor of the Roman Empire after Constantine. Constantine made Christianity the, 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 the religion of the Roman Empire. And, and Julian was called the apostate because he didn't want that. He wanted to bring back pagan religion. He wanted to bring back the pagan gods and he wanted to bring back the pagan priests. And, and while he's trying to do this, he gets really annoyed and he says, there's a letter in antiquity about him writing to the priests. And this is what he says. When he writes to the priests, he says, you need to go out and care for the needy. He said, the, uh, the Christians, which he called impious Galileans, are out there serving the needy. Not only are they serving their own needy, they're serving our needy. And they're only doing it to make us look bad. So you need to get out there and do it. Basically, this is the idea that that's working for them. We should do it. You go and do it. Now, it never happened for two good reasons. One, Julian died. That was a drawback. But you know the other reason they didn't do it? Because they didn't believe it. It wasn't a part of their framework. It wasn't a part of their worldview. They didn't follow anybody that said, you serve me when you serve the poor. It was, it was the followers of Jesus that did that. So we just uh, have created, we're creating another series, the new series of Jesus the Game Changer called Towards the End, To the Ends of the Earth. We'll be out in October this year. And as part of that, we interviewed a guy called Tom Holland. Uh, I heard about Tom Holland when we were releasing Jesus the Game Changer in England a couple of years ago. I'm talking to Justin Briley, who's from uh, a great t- a radio show called Unbelievable. We're chatting and he basically pushed this article across the table to me and said, this is going to be released this week. You should read it. And the article by Tom Holland was called, Why I Changed My Mind About Christianity, which is why we interviewed him. Now, this is really important. If you look up Tom Holland, Tom Holland is not saying he's a Christian. He's changed his mind about Christianity. Tom Holland is, uh, loves the Greco-Roman world, is a Greco-Roman historian. He's written kind of novels and books about the Greco-Roman world. He's, he's uh, done ITV, I think it is, uh, documentaries about the Greco-Roman world. But one of the things that happened to him, and this article says, says this, and we interviewed him. He's a fabulous, erudite, thoughtful uh, guy. And he, he talked about looking at the Greco-Roman world and and just seeing it through another set of eyes. Nothing particularly radical happened. He just looked at it more closely. And he suddenly realised that the Greco-Roman world was a brutal and awful place. They, 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 would, they would kill disabled children because they were useless. And nobody saw that as a negative thing. That was, in fact, almost a sign of, of, of their moral standing that they would do that. When, when Caesar took over the Gauls, kind of the French area, he killed a million of them and enslaved a million more. And that was not seen as somehow negative. He, he started to see the Greco-Roman world through this, this lens of whether they cared and realised that their actions, and this is to quote him, their actions were morally repellent. And he's saying, that is so far from where we are today. Whether you're a Christian or not, whether, whether, whether you have never gone to church once in your life, you, would li- you live in Western societies where you look at that and you go, that is wrong. And Tom Holland is asking, so what changed? How come then that was okay and everybody saw that was fine, now it's not okay? I love to use this example just to give this a bit of colour. It's like the movie Gladiator. You know, you like Gladiator? Remember that? It's an old movie now. It's so old. It was back when Russell Crowe was slender and, you know, built. Not so much anymore. And uh, so Russell Crowe's in Gladiator. I love Gladiator. I love the movie. I love the whole... But think about Gladiators. This is, I mean, this is a true story. This, these people existed. Here's a whole class of people, several thousand of them, whose only reason to exist, only reason to exist, was to walk into an arena in front of, at times, thousands of people and fight each other to the death to entertain crowds. We're not talking tomato sauce and fake blood. We're talking actual death. You imagine that? And nobody sits in the crowd going, is that a good idea? Nobody cared. And here's Holland, not 
not as a Christian, not as a religious person. He's not there yet. I think he's very getting close. He's not there yet. As an historian, thoughtful individual and asking, how do we get from there to here? And you know what he realised? person of Jesus, the teaching of the Bible, the early church. And Holland in his article says, you know, people like Voltaire and the French and Italian Enlightenment, they didn't, they didn't create a society that cared. They lived off what came before them. And what he ends his article with is this statement, basically. He said, while the West is rejecting Christian faith that has been a part of Western nations for centuries, he said, what I've come to realise, his own statement, what I've come to realise, that in my values and my morals, I am not Greek or Roman at all, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. Now, he's not saying, I'm a follower of Jesus. He's saying the way that I live and the morals and values that are my foundational values for life that I hold on to on a daily basis, they go back to the Christian church. They go back to the person of Jesus. They go back to what the early Christians did and I can thank them for my morals today. I'm believing that Tom Holland will get there. He's written a new book that's about to be released, which is basically all around the issue of Jesus the Game Changer. And, and his last chapter is his own private journey and he's, because of his, his godmother and it's quite a remarkable chapter but here is this notion that the individual matters because of the teaching of Jesus that we care because of the teaching of Jesus but here is one potential flaw that you might be walking away from today and and think you've grasped what I've said because you might be saying to yourself okay I think I get this Carl Jesus came made major sociological changes, that's changed the world and we're a different place because of that, got it. That would be wrong. You know how Jesus changed the world? One person at a time. That's how Jesus changed the world. One individual at a time. One life at a time. And as each person, each life and each individual were changed by Jesus, they said, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to live out his values. And they changed their world. I want to wrap with a story. You'll know the name William Wilberforce. If you don't, let me fill you in. For those you've never heard of William Wilberforce, he lived in the 18th and 19th century in England. And he's well known because in 1807, he, he in the British Parliament, abolished the slave trade, the trading of slaves. And then 1833, three days before he died, they passed a... a, a a law that said slavery was abolished. And that was kind of his, one of his life works. And most of us go, there he go, as a Christian, because most people know as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, he abolished the slave trade. That's not the whole story. See, Wilberforce grew up in a wealthy family in, in Hull. His, his father died when he was nine, but his family was a merchant family. He went to, went to Cambridge University and basically partied his way through Cambridge, paying, playing cards and carousing. Let's just leave it there. Uh, he, he was having a good time. He was having a great time. At 21, kept, got this, at 21, he became the member for Hull and goes to, to uh, Westminster as the member for Hull to the British Parliament. Uh, he's, he's a great orator. He's a great singer. He, people love him. He's invited to five exclusive clubs as soon as he gets to Melbourne. His best mate was William Pitt. William Pitt's dad was the Prime Minister. William Pitt would go on to be the Prime Minister. This guy has got it made. Early 20s, in all the right circles, best friends to the most influential people in England. It's all happening for him. Then a couple of years later, he goes on holidays. He goes on holidays to Europe, uh, slightly different from your holiday in Europe. And if you think about it, if you're going through a holiday in Europe in uh, the uh, late uh, 19th, 18th century, uh, how do you travel around? Well, horse and carriage. And you're travelling across France and, and Europe in a horse and carriage. What do you do? No phone, no w n Wi-Fi, no net. No. I mean, how would we survive? Like, seriously, what sort of holiday is that? And, and he's, he's in this carriage, his, his mum's there, his auntie, a couple of family members, but also a guy called Isaac Milner. Because what you do when you don't have any of those things, you talk. There's a novel concept. <laughs> they talk. And he's discussed with Isaac Milner. Now, Isaac Milner was from Cambridge University and they used to describe Isaac Milner and Cambridge University as being incredibly smart. So if people in Cambridge University think you're smart, you're really smart. 
And they had this discussion about a book on, on, on faith and belief and religion. And in this whole process, William Wilberforce comes to a place of faith. He believes that Jesus is who he said he was. He believes he needs to give his life into Jesus' hands and he becomes a Christian on this holiday. And you're probably thinking, wow, he's now hit the jackpot. He's got all that other stuff he had before and now he's a follower of Jesus. It's all come together. And he goes home on a kind of swept home on a cloud of joy and wonder. He went home totally depressed. He gets back to England and he's depressed. You know why he's depressed? Because he thinks he's wasted his life. He's wasted his education. He's wasting his time in, in, in Parliament. He's wasting all his friendships. Now with his newfound faith, what does all of that now mean to William Wilberforce? So he decides he has to talk to someone. He can't think of anyone to talk to but a guy called John Newton. John Newton wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. The original one, not the one with the new hipster verse in it, you know. So the, the, the original Amazing Grace that John Newton wrote. John Newton wrote that because, if for those of you who don't know, the reason he wrote that is he used to be a slave trader. Newton ran, was a captain of a slave trip ship. And at one, one journey, uh, there was this huge storm. Uh, he was desperate. He prayed to God that if you save me, I'll become a Christian. Uh, the storm, he, he lasted out the storm and now he's stuck. Uh, he actually stayed as a slave, slave ship uh, captain for about seven years after that, which is really interesting. But eventually he becomes a, an Anglican priest, an Anglican minister. He becomes a very popular one. He's in the centre of, of London. There's a very popular Anglican priest and people would come from all over the place to listen to John Newton speak. And then William Wilberforce decides he's the only guy he should talk to. So he goes to see him and he said, what should I do? Should I leave Parliament? Should I, should I become an Anglican priest like you? Is that, is that what I should do? And John Newton looked at him and said, no, you're in the right place. This is your moment. God has you in Parliament for this moment. Changed his life. William Wilberforce left there with two great aims in life. One, the abolition of the slave trade. Two, the reformation of manners in England, which is about morality, not cutlery. It was about how to change the moral framework of that country. He became part of the Clapham sect. Uh, just a remarkable story. But William Wilberforce, with his friends at the Clapham sect, they started like more than 20 organisations. The British and Foreign Bible Society, the Bible Society, Clapham sect started. Uh, Christian Mission Society, CMS, Clapham sect started. Uh, caring for animal welfare group, Clapham sect started. This guy was completely changed, gave his life to this. You know why? Because Jesus changed him. That's why he did it. He didn't read a book and have a discussion with Isaac Milner and said, you should go home and make a better society. And when you make a better society, the world will be better. And I think that's what Jesus wants you to do. No, Jesus changed his life. Jesus was a game changer in William Wilberforce's life and he became a game changer in his world. And you know what? Here we are, 200 and something years later after William Wilberforce, 2,000 years after Jesus and nothing has changed. The message is exactly the same. Nothing has shifted. As if Jesus was talking to us personally or William Wilberforce was here talking to us or we're here this morning. Jesus wants to change the game. And then you change the game around you. Every one of us are called to that end and that's how the world has changed. One person at a time, one individual at a time, one life at a time. But what about you? Do you need the game changed? Did you drag yourself here this morning wondering why you bother? Have you sat through the service wondering what this is all about? Are you coming this morning thinking, I'm, this, is the, this is the last shot I'm giving this. I'm, I'm, I know, nothing's working for me. Are you tired of playing the game of church? Because when you're tired of doing that, God wants to start work. Because the game ought to be changed in you. Your life can be changed. And guess what? You can change your world. Isn't that a fabulous thought? I don't care how old or young you are here this morning, you can change your world. Nobody else may ever know you may never be written up anywhere. No one will write a book about you. Who cares? You can change the game. This community, this city, this state can be a different place because you change the game. 
your street, your house, your family, your school, your workplace, your group of friends, your sporting organisation, wherever it is you find yourself, if you go in there with the game changed in you, you can change the game and the place is different. William Wilberforce did an incredible thing for the world because he was placed in a time that was really significant and God used him incredibly. But small or large, great or small, hugely influential or just one tiny corner of the world, the, the, the essence is the same. The game has to change here before we change the game out there. Do you want the game changed? Do you want to live out your calling? You want to be a person who makes a difference in your world? starts with you. I want to take a moment to pray and give you the opportunity for a shift, a change, a fresh start. So will you join me in prayer? Music team will join us, but let me, let me lead you in prayer. What's your prayer this morning? What's God saying to you? Just between you and your heavenly father, this is your moment, nobody else's. We're in a public space, but this is a private moment for you. What's God saying? Do you need the game changed? In your own heart, in the quietness, why don't you respond with your own set of words? Give your life to God afresh this morning. Admit that you need the game changed and you need Jesus to come into you afresh and in you this morning to experience his power and influence in your life. And where are you being called to change the game? What's your call? Small or large? Significant or unnoticed? What is it? Lord, we give ourselves to you again today. Lord, we want the game changed so that we're different people. We want to make an individual and fresh start with you again today. Lord, we lay our lives before you and we thank you for Jesus' death and resurrection and our new start in you and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And yet, Lord, we ask that you would show us where we'd change the game. Lord, we repent of being small-minded, selfish people concerned about our own outcomes. We commit ourselves to our community, the people we love, the people around us. Lord, show us where we are to be game changers in this community. Amen.